So if you're solving a problem or a challenge, make sure that solution will deliver opportunity or at least be looking for opportunities that you could solution and then go forward with those. So I've, I've come more of now, more of a shift where problem solving might be inside of what I'm calling the opportunity solution. Len? <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little bit about <laughs> tell me a little bit about some of the work you've done, Len, and just I think it'd be great for people to hear more about your perspectives, what you've learned, and just a synopsis about like where's innovation these days? Because all you hear about is proficiency, efficiency, and AI, and nobody talks about innovation anymore. I see the word pop up a lot. There's still a lot of books and a lot of discussion around it. My thinking is is I got all hooked on this back in the my IBM days when I was working on developing their re-engineering methodology and working with my camera because it was like break the mold, think out of the box, re-engineering. And I had to do a lot of research for a couple of years to put the method and the course in place. And that's where I really got hooked on it. So IBM used to say, think. So I said, no, rethink. So I started that in 92 and I've been rethinking ever since. And I try to bring a lot of that rethinking into my client engagements. Whether they're looking for innovation or not, I just feel responsible that if there's a better way to bring it to their attention and uh, advise on that. And sometimes they're looking for innovation. I've had the extremes where I've been dropped into a project that's in trouble and you got to find your way before you could think about doing something different. And then I've had someone come up to me and say, I need your help. I want to have a nonprofit to help underserved youth. I got the domain name. (laughs) So I spent a couple of years on that and put up a nonprofit for someone. And then likewise, someone else said, I got got this idea about business to business and matchmaking consultants. and, And I got this domain name. So I spent about a year and a half on that one. But some clients like the one I'm working with recently, is doing things innovative, like in support, customer support, brought in an AI app, the support logic, which looks at sentiment and helps folks anticipate an an escalated case before it escalates and could do quite a few things to reduce the backlog and increase customer sat. So I've seen a variety of it in different ways. A lot of my projects are program and project management based. And some of them are straight out of the box where we have to think differently and and come up with a new way to approach something. So I look at innovation like there's three eyes. On one end, you've got invention. Something wasn't there before, and now it is, and it's a real invention. Usually people get patents for those. I have a patent for problem solving in the U.S. and ideation. On the other side, you have improvement, which means something's there and just made a little bit better of the plenty of examples of innovation. Improvement might be something where I have got this cord to wrap up. Now I've got this thing I pull and the cord wraps itself up. It's still a cord. It's still going to plug into the power. You just made it wrap up different. An improvement to a product or some feature. And then in the middle is innovation. Innovation is usually coming from a lot of ideas. People are having lots of ideas from things that exist or may not exist, but they just think would be better. I've seen this the evolution of the invention of a vacuum cleaner to maybe what people might say is the innovation of the iRobot that just goes around and says, why do people need to vacuum? Let this thing vacuum for you. I have one of those. And I know, I learned in the first release of it what the I stand for. Idiot. Idiot <laughs> robot. Because it just, I could do things quicker than that could. It made a lot of noise. It bumped into things. I had to kick it around once in a while to get it going the right way. They did an innovation. They put an eye on it. So now I can see where it's going and it's a lot smoother process. So you learn, you improve, and you innovate. But they didn't change the name of it. Say what? They didn't change the name. No, they didn't change the name. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe the I now, they should have put a a E-Y-E. But anyway, I could sum those three things up when I work with clients as opportunity. Is there an opportunity to invent, which is a lot more rigorous? 
Is there an opportunity to improve, which you should be doing anyhow, but as you're doing that improvement, is there an opportunity to innovate? It's, the word's been overkill, but there's no reason if there's a way to find a better solution that creates opportunity, that's really where my focus is with clients, regardless of the type of project or engagement. Yeah. Okay. So question for you. And I was having a conversation about innovation with a colleague and we were talking about innovation in the design space because there's so much emphasis there these days. And you could argue that any kind of a new design is quote unquote innovative. And I think many of them are, to your point, improvements. And we were talking about one person in particular in the design realm of lifestyle design, Martha Stewart. She's an icon, an I versus an icon. (laughs) But she is, I believe, one of the more innovative people in the design space because she exemplifies the ability to incorporate things that we see, ideas, and bring them into a way to create new opportunity. And she does it with almost a seamless effortlessness, but she's always looking at things. In fact, we were talking about the fact that she now attends the the annual electronic and consumer products and she's into TikTok and all kinds of different technologies because she's seeing ways to monetize her own ideation. It's very interesting. And so there's an example of someone that maybe thinks about it, but doesn't consider herself an innovation expert. It's another way of think about it, maybe. Yeah, I think innovation comes from just maybe thinking differently and seeing opportunity. And I remember, I used to live in Westport, Connecticut. So I remember Martha Stewart, when she first started out, she was in this little home, like townhouse home. And she used to do catering for folks in Westport. And there were quite a few people that were well-known in Westport, actors, singers, business people. And she made some really nice stuff. So they used to just, okay, let's get Martha to do this. And She built her business up and yeah, she's continued with the cookbooks and the innovations in the cooking and the product lines. I I cook for a hobby, so I'm pretty familiar. I have several of her products and they're good. They're quality products and they're good. And I think she does reinvent herself. She's still Martha Stewart. She continues to seek opportunity. And I think that for me is the big point on innovation and problem solving. Over the years, I've come to think something doesn't smell right here. I'm at the wrong end of the horse. I've been talking problem solving, but then I thought about that in the context of there's a lot of people caught up in the chaos of solving problems. Is it really a problem for them? So we should say, oh, look at the problem statement. Make sure you got the right problem statement. Then you can go forward and you come up with the right solution. But then you might find out that the solution doesn't make a darn bit of difference. All right. Maybe we should just turn get to the other end of the horse and look forward because if you have a little bit of insight, but a lot more foresight, you can start to say, let me think about the opportunity first. What opportunities are there for what I do, for what I have, or what's not there that I could provide? And then say, well, now when I look at that, what challenges do I have that I have to overcome in order to do that? So if you're solving a problem or a challenge, make sure that solution will deliver opportunity or at least be looking for opportunities that you could solution and then go forward with those. So I've I've come more of now, more of a shift where problem solving might be inside of what I'm calling the opportunity solution. Question. Let's play a scenario. I'm in a company. We're up against tight timelines. We're being told to do a project with, let's say, I don't know, master data management. Everybody's trying to master their data along with everything else. Uh, Somebody's putting together, team is putting together a solution. And we're looking at this and saying, gosh, 
that seems like it's to be pretty expensive. It's not the best way to do it. There isn't time to innovate, right? No one wants to hear innovation. They're like, just get it done. And so you have the tyranny of the moment, which is what most companies live by. And so how do you get them to stand back and say, wait a minute, what are we doing in the first place? Why are we doing this? And should we be building it? And or is this the is this really the best thing we can do with the effort and time and resources that we're going to spend? First thing I would do is try to assess with them, why do they believe it's important? What information do they have? What do they know or believe they know, which are not just assumptions, but assumptions that have a high degree of certainty? Why do you think this is important? And then from there, start to unravel if it's important to do it, what are you expecting to get from doing it? And why is that important? And who is that important to? Is that important to the business? And it makes no difference to your to whoever you're serving, products, services, your customers? Or is it something that's going to be more beneficial to your customers? Or maybe both. It should at least be beneficial to you and your customers, or for sure your customers. A lot of times there's this internal churn that goes on trying to fix things that just creates more churn. It doesn't necessarily get you what you expect. So where I find the rub is that they don't know what they expect, or if they know what they're expecting from it, how are you going to know you get it? How are you going to realize the benefit? So I use a model that I had a chance to work with Dr. Fernando Flores for a few months. He was out of Stanford. And he has this value-based model that he uses, which says you really need to focus on what's the request, how are you going to do that request. And when you figure out how to do the request, differentiate between the requirements of just getting it done and the expectations of getting it done. Because in those expectations lives the desired outcome of the value. So if I'm doing something for a customer, I'm anticipating that what I'm going to give to them, they're going to use to create value for someone else. That's the value chain progression. So I want to know what's the value. So if they come up and say, we don't know how to measure that yet, or we're not measuring it, then I have to say, what? let's talk about the data. <laughs> and... and then we're, we get that to the center of the table and we can start to say, what data are you getting and what's its use? What data are you not getting? That might be even more important than the data that they're getting. So it's worth it if I can get them to have that discussion. Right. But if they say, no, we just need to get on with it, then you have to try to be at least conscious as you're going along that if you see something that's going clunk, to try to bring that to the surface and deal with it without letting it create a situation that becomes a blocker. But one thing that I feel I have a responsibility to do on that project or program when I'm if I'm managing it or I'm involved in it is at least they might not ask for it, but I might create, here's your risk register. And these are the triggers you need to look for along this timeline if you think you're going to be making that. But to know if the data is the right data, the wrong data, whatever it is, or enough data, that's where analytics comes in. Analyze the data and see what it's telling you. And it may, they may not have enough to get the insight, to give them the foresight to, to see where you're headed with this stuff. What, how, what is it telling you about you? It might be telling you a bunch of baloney that you know is making you think you need to do that when in fact, you're not analyzing the data correctly. I think you hit on the core of it right there. Frank and I have had a number of conversations and Frank can jump in on this one because I know it's near and dear to his heart around how do we measure what's what we should be doing, whether we're doing it right, whether we're going to get the right outcomes. And there's an enormous amount of effort that's put into like analytics and companies for the purposes, especially from, from a business perspective. But when it comes to project-based, when we are investing in change, 
the whole point of investing in the change rather than buying it, so to speak, is that we should be able to create organic improvement at a price point that's better and achieve better results than if you just simply took the money and put it into an account and said, okay, I can get 4%. Now, the real ability to measure and do the analytics like you're talking about is something that I don't see I don't see that kind of maturity and it's 2023 and I'm thinking like tick tock when are we going to get there especially when it comes to strategy where a lot of the innovation at business level innovation is needs to really start to happen because it's just the pace of change and I don't know Frank we talked about some of this stuff before yeah, there's a Len made an important point. I'm not sure how important he thinks it is, but he made a comment about the importance of importance. Okay. And I think it's an interesting thing. He says, you have to, this thing may be important, so we have to deal with it. And I suddenly realized that over these two centuries, last century and this one, I've come to look at properties of things like the properties of a project, the properties of a strategy, and so on. And these are simple things like impact and likelihood, like you have a risk and you have the importance and you have difficulty and skill levels and stuff that you associate with these. These are all the things that you need to make something happen. And one of the things I noticed was that these things change over time. That is, you need some type of a semantic predictive analytics, not a quantitative one. And I began to watch something go from not important to possibly important to very important, to critical over a period of two or three years. And what happens at that time, I also noticed that the difficulty of the task went from not difficult to very difficult. The skill level went from high skill to low skill. And I always say, you said, oh crap, I can't do this because I no longer have the skills, the difficult task, and now it's very important. And the CEO is saying, why is that the case? But nobody's been doing the little kind of simple predictive analytics on the properties. And so I got more into this and found out when I did the talk in London that people asked about this. They said, well, how do you do this? Because this stuff was not important two years ago. All of a sudden, it's important. You know, now how do we deal with that change or how can we track that change or anticipate that change? So there's a change in the properties that impacts and relates to the changes in the outcomes of something you're doing. So that was one issue that, that I was trying to deal with. And then I know that Len is heavily involved with the Project Management Institute, PMI, and I wondered how innovation relates to things like portfolio management. And I know that portfolio management has been an agonizing topic for at least 25 or 30 years, if not more, because it deals with program management and it deals with how do I do this? And it deals with trying to ignore all the failures in the past of trying to do this. So I would appreciate a comment there from Len about how do we deal with some of this stuff, especially innovation, because when I connect, I say, Here's an example. I was involved in the early days, like last century, with Telco, which dealt with video. Okay, you needed 800 lines in a trunk to transmit one video and something like $10,000 a minute. Okay, this is not practical, unless, you're, unless only the wealthy are going to talk on this thing. Over time, you had something either improvement or innovation or some combination. Do you follow me? And because I can remember saying, there's no way that we're ever going to have video. Who the heck wants to see a woman in her curlers or a guy in his jockey shorts or whatever it is? And I said, obviously, we don't have video today, do we? Every cell phone and our billions of them has video. I said, so here we are at the other end of that sequence of 40, 50 years, 40, 50 years, something like that, because I was only three when we started. And uh, yeah, we are, we are at this point now. And we're saying, okay, we have all this stuff. What part of this was innovation? And what part would be improvement? Or is this sort of a slider that says you have huge innovation in the beginning, then gradual improvement? It becomes improved. Is there something like this? That's my question. How do I view this? Okay, Len. <laughs> I, I see you have the answer to this by your smile. You're looking for a stepwise formula from Len to say, okay, um, this is what <laughs> happens, and then this is the hype, and then this is uh, that's not you easy. Know, it, it depends. It depends how you look at things and where you're looking. So if you think about risk management, the one that is very rarely talked about is looking at risk as opportunity. Yeah. You've got the other ways to mitigate risk, but 
rarely do people put up a risk and say, wait a second, is anybody else doing that? Why not? Why is that a risk for us? Likewise, when you look at portfolio management and you try to figure out years ago, they used to say, I've got this much money and I've got these resources and these skills. So I've got all these projects. These are my goals listed by relative importance. What fits? They used to call that the efficient frontier. So at that point, if I throw another million dollars at it, I'm only going to get maybe a 5% improvement. So that's the sweet spot. That's where I'm going to go. I've had a very good friend that's dealt in that space for over 30 years, creating different portfolio management applications, approaches, methods. And the new thinking that got my attention was constraints. You can look at constraints like you can look at the risks and flip them. Flip the constraints and say, that's a constraint for us. Is there any opportunity for that not to be a constraint for us? Where's the opportunity in that constraint? Is it a self-imposed constraint? Now, meanwhile, you've got the operational level. They're busy because they've got the mandates to improve performance. They got metrics. Do the metrics align with the strategic desired outcomes? Otherwise, they're doing a lot of busy work. They might be coming up with some improvements. They might be boosting something. Maybe sales is boosting sales a little bit. Maybe they're getting a little bit more throughput. Maybe they're solving more cases. But how does that measure up if you don't have top level measures that align with what they're doing? So at the end of the day, you can look and say, oh, you've improved X percent, which boosts our OKI or our KPI, our measurement that we're taking, whether it's customer SAT or it's customer trust or if it's customer improved sales. So it's where, what are you looking at? How are you looking at it? Where are you looking? Are you just looking this way to your competitors? Are you, or are you looking at how your customers are assimilating what you've put out there? Where's that data coming from? Now, you've got a good analytic tool. It could just put all of those in the pot, stir it up, and give you a pretty good picture. Or should be able to give you a pretty good picture of how well you're aligned. Where are you putting your money? Where are you looking? Where are those constraints? Why do you think you have those constraints? Where's the opportunity to break through? So I always call business is busy, most businesses, except for maybe entrepreneurial and fast growth, where they're just hustling. They're busy with busy work. They're in the chaos. They don't have much time to think strategically. They want project managers these days to be like the program manager. Project manager was responsible for meeting the objectives of the project. Program managers delivering the benefits. Now they want the project manager to be responsible for delivering the benefits. Oh, for, and they uh, are, involved. are they asking the project managers to also measure them? To be responsible for understanding and delivering the expected benefits for the project, which usually has been at another level. The problem I see is they're not in the strategic conversation. They're not at the table. So they might give them a K, an OKR or KPI, some metric, and they have to deliver on that, which is interesting if they don't if they don't get to see the data that helps them analyze the progression of what they're doing and how close they're coming to meeting that particular desired outcome. Let me ask you a different question. Similar to playing off of what you just said, where do you see or where have you seen examples where we've innovated management? We've innovated leadership. There's no shortage of people, cottage industry of leadership training and all that. God knows it's a wonderful industry. But where's the real innovation in leadership and in thinking around what is management? What are managers supposed to do? And how do we make sure that we're measuring the right things to achieve stepwise innovation? From my perspective, the leader is usually someone that's going to provide the vision for where you want 
to have the business or that organization, that team headed. The manager is going to provide the guidance to help those folks understand how to get done what they need to get done in order to achieve that particular vision or desired outcome. There's two, there's different, there's, you need both. I'm not going to say throw the managers out. You need to have someone that's somewhat pragmatic, organized, performance oriented to help folks progress and make sure you're getting to the right place that the leader may have set from the outset as far as the strategy, the vision of the desired outcomes. But then there's different skills. And the different skills are what we used to call people skills, soft skills. Now they're calling them power skills for leaders. And I don't particularly like the word power skills because it's not about power. They're powerful skills to have. And those are the ones we know about. You're creative, you're collaborative, you serve good leaders, the stuff that the folks that can motivate and inspire people. There's an interesting problem now. In the most recent PMI, Pulse of the Profession, they took a survey around the importance and value that businesses see in these power skills. Over 40% of the survey, folks, businesses surveyed, didn't see the value in it. And they're not investing in it. They don't see the cost benefit of investing in the leadership skills that are now called power skills, which we've always felt were good if you're a servant leader and so forth. They don't see the value in investing in that and spending the money on it. Yet, these poor souls that are leaders or are not, or people that are just busting it for the company, guess what? It's still in their performance plan to act that way or have that. But yet they're not getting, it's like, you're on your own. Hope there's a parachute in there. You know, so that to me in this most recent year, looking at that report, that's pretty depressing. Because I believe a leader doesn't have people follow them. A leader, fo a leader enables them to advance and the leader advances with them. By advancing others, you advance yourself. You don't look this way back and say, where is everybody? You know where they are. They're in front of you. The leader should have the foresight. They all have to have the right data in order to know what they're doing. They all have to have the right perspectives. But you need both. But I think the leadership, where the innovation is coming, is an understanding a lot more about people, a lot more connections with people, understanding how people need to have a life-work balance, which post-COVID has really come about because now they're doing things remote and they can balance their life. I see it. I see in the team's chat, be right back, got to take the dog out. And these people are happier. They're working better. They're working smarter. It's almost like they're all in the same room. That's interesting because there are more and more articles about back-to-work programs and now you're seeing articles about a power struggle, the word power, between managers and leaders and employees. And it's, okay, we're playing this out and we're, are we going to take a step back in productivity, in employee engagement, or is this, should we return back to where we were? Is there, are people looking at the data or are they reacting on emotion? you think? I think it's a little bit of, of both. And I think it's probably the managers have some sense of needing to touch and feel and manage people, walk the floor mentality. They're probably feeling somewhat insecure. I would be more secure if I knew everybody was here. Like I know where all the little chicks are. So the leader is a little bit going to be a little bit more trusting and a little more collaborative and open to that. And I think there's a balance. Many things in life, there's always been like, whether it's entertainment in the entertainment business or any business, the pendulum swing. We were all over here and we're all coming to the office and we all had to have an office and we all rented office space. And then COVID hit and 
this. Now we're going to do the pendulum. So we're going to go all the way back to everybody back in the office. And these mandates don't make any sense unless you have something to get the degree of certainty as to why you need everybody back in that same space. What's the motivation? A lot of motivation for everything, unfortunately, is the dollar. We could lift our heads up from that a little bit and realize that those dollars are being produced by people that are working their butts off. Maybe we could be a little more open-minded. Yeah, I think one of the issues we have that we have to deal with today that was not as much of an issue in the past is what does a manager do, a line manager, supervisor, manager, director level people? Because they're not strategic oriented. At best, at best they might be tactical oriented, but they're really operational oriented. I've dealt with a lot of them in my career. When I say a lot, I'm talking about well over a thousand. Okay. And what I found out is that logical sequential thinkers tend to be really good line managers. They're focused on what has to be done today. And the issue within that is control. I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a good way, that they have to guide what's happening to achieve the outcomes that are short term. It's hard to do that remote. That's what the problem is, I think. Then you got the intuitive thinkers, which direct things all over the place. And then if they get to the goal, they're happy. But generally, they're the creative ones. They're the, and you don't need a lot of them. There was an HBR article some years ago that said, if the ratio is seven to one, seven logical thinkers to one, you're in good shape. If you have too many creative thinkers, you don't accomplish a lot of goals. If you have too many logical, you don't do any innovation. It's really interesting. There's a balance there. They said, you got to get the work done. You need somebody who's going to take the hill, basically. And I find that the more I've talked to these the managers, that I've, and I've had a lot of interface with them over the years, the more I realize they have a, it's a difficult job to maintain control remote. It just is. And I think that's where some of the issues are. When they find that when they're comfortable that the person will actually get the work done, which you have in more in, in the professional expert environment, like in medicine, a doctor in an operating room, they don't have to watch, and there's nobody watching over the shoulder to make sure they're doing it right. That's the expert. Everything is around the expert to get the work done. In fact, they don't even manage the operating room. An MD doing surgery is focused on the surgery. You don't want them also managing the operating room. The operating room supervisor does that. So this is something not a lot of people understand about how you manage expertise. The same thing is true in a law firm. You want them. So when you get into professional expert occupations like that, you are supporting the expert, basically. That's a different approach. But the experts then tend to be more the intuitive, creative people, and they don't understand the management part of it, of what happens on a day-to-day basis. And I see this in clinics all the time. The MDs don't understand anything about supply chain or how you manage this or measure the performance or what, the, what how you handle the patients. They're saying, oh, I can handle 20 patients today. We can only seat 40 in the room you know, where they come in. So you want them standing around or waiting in their car. What do you want? You know, that's a very practical thing. And I, I had a good, this innovation stuff is really interesting. Here's an experience, actual experience I had several years ago. I was in the Middle East doing training. And one of the managing directors of the organization I was working with, the training organization, came to me and said, we have found that your material has been converted to Arabic and is being sold, and we're going after them with our attorneys. And I looked at the guy and said, are they selling very many of these? They said, yes, that's the problem. I said, why don't you go work a deal with them? <laughs> why don't you work a deal with them instead of trying to kill them? Here's a, to me, that was a business opportunity. To them, they were working with a constraint. So I said, okay, we have strategy by constraint here. <laughs> That's what we're doing. They can't do that. They, no, they just thought they could not do that. And I found that, that fascinated me. And I, there's no way I could change them. This was a belief in their head. And I said, I don't have enough years to try to change that or help them with that. They went after them legally and shut them down. Because they were stealing intellectual property, basically. That's, that, that was the bottom line. And I looked at that and I said, for me, that was a revenue stream. <laughs> I looked at it totally differently. And I just couldn't get the first base with these guys talking about. It. Well, but that's, that's a good example of something innovative that they would not accept. That's a good point. And I think you're right about a balance. And that's why I think one innovation could be to look at the process. What is your work habits? What is your work process? What is it you're trying to get done? And where are those touch points where you really need to have people in the office and why? So there's some places now that have come up with it, uh, 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 at least an approach that seems balanced. All right, we come in two days a week. 
I have some that say we come in once every quarter, man mandatory. But if you understand, and you can use analytics for that, you can look at the process and say, what is our process? What are we doing at what points in time? Or what is our project? Where do we need to be face to face? Where do we need to be here? Where do we all need to be eye to eye at the whiteboard, whatever it is, and strike that balance so that you understand life work balance, work process balance, project balance between being innovative and being leading and managing. I think it's important to have managers. You need to have both in the equation that they know how to get it done and folks know where they're going by getting it done. Yeah, here's a quick point. My my wife was a VP of marketing and sales, and this is what she told me. If my sales reps are spending more than one day a week in the office, they're not doing their job. Now that's interesting. That's where working remote is really important because you got to be making sales calls, okay? Otherwise, they're not selling anything. She was in medical sales. And she says, one day a week, that's it. And and mainly it's to review stuff and get them out with what's going to happen next. Bang, they're gone. She doesn't see them for another week. Was your wife a logical thinker? She was probably a balance between the two because she was trained as a nurse because she was in a medical business. Nurses right. tend to be logical, sequential, because they follow procedure religiously, or the patient dies or something. There's right. consequ big consequences there. So this is, this is really interesting, because there are a number of cases where people that were logical, sequential thinkers made the transition to yeah. working do, with remote. And I'm wondering, when I was asking the question, Len, earlier about how to, examples of how we innovate management. This is a great example of how do we get these kinds of folks to start being able to upskill their capabilities so that they can more effectively manage, le still leveraging their strengths, but extend them so that they are now able to get the best of both worlds. There, there's an interesting book. What I, like about, what I love about what you just said is you made that statement and you put it in the context of an opportunity. Yeah. What's our opportunity to? Not what problem, what's our problem why people aren't coming to the office and I need to have them here? How are you looking at it? And then what data? Analytics now could have you look at things in so many different ways. If you use that, to, to understand what you're trying to accomplish, you can look at those different scenarios and say which one fits. But the way you said it was just so perfect in the sense that you stated it as an opportunity. And that's really what I've been trying to focus on a lot more these days is let's solution this by starting with the opportunity, not starting with the problem. The problem. Yes, everybody, but critical thinkers always start with the problem. And that's the challenge, I think, that you're just outlining as well, Frank. Another example is, okay, like I'll talk to architects in companies that business architects, enterprise architects, whatever the flavor is, and their frustration is we don't we don't have any we don't have any influence on projects because they're all using agile and the business mm -hmm. analysts are like what are we supposed to do because there's no time to do requirements and do the kind of things that we used to do and there's a concern and they're all outlining problems so there's obviously an impact and people are seeing benefits of productivity from Agile. The question might be around measurement to pull something that Len was talking about and tease on that a bit and say, okay, we're seeing a lot of improvements with productivity, but maybe we can improve the reuse of our investments in technology. Now, that may open the door for more architecture, or we're not getting, maybe when we start measuring the impact, we're not really achieving the desired outcomes. We're doing the expected outcomes or what we think the right outcomes are because we made up our own measurement. And how do we start looking at ways to improve the way we plan and direct the 
you know, the investments and the efforts of the technologists in many cases and the process management folks so that we get there. And that may be a way to open the conversation towards more of opportunity. There's an interesting point that we have, and I'll try to make this one real quick because it's actually a very, it's a large topic. One of the things I've noticed in my own life and other people's life, my colleagues' lives, is rethinking what you are and what you're doing. And I find that this is, there's, there was a book written about this called Strength to Strength. And it has to do with as we get more experience and we age, we tend to broaden our thinking and think a little more laterally, which conflicts with thinking the logical sequential stuff. So when you're younger, this is now this is a huge generalization. When you're younger, you tend to be logical, sequential, if you're that type of thinker, and you tend to be a good line manager. But as you get a lot more experience and background, your skill is not so much in the detail and the detailed management that it becomes broader. You begin to do cross-domain things like that. The really good ones, they go up in management because that's what you tend to do when you get to be senior managers. You have to have that kind of perspective. The issue that this gentleman brought out in a book is it's not easy to predict at what age this happens, okay? It is not easy. And it turns out that it depends on the occupation you chose. Like musicians almost never go through this or academicians, but you get people that work on a line go through this, okay? And what happens is you have to match where the person's at. And I'm not talking about how to do this because I don't really know. I'm not that knowledgeable about that, except that you have to see where's the person at and is it more likely that they will be open to an innovative thing at this point rather than at this point? Okay, so if they're hot into the logical sequential, like a lot of us techies were. Okay, I would, when I was younger, I was very focused that way. If you had another idea, I didn't have time to even look at it. But as I spread out more, and I've seen this amongst the architects also, they're, tech, they're technically oriented. They're not oriented towards what, how to deal with the opportunities and stuff and they tend to focus on getting the tasks done, the architecture task. And so I find that as they get older, they tend to be a little more relaxed about this. They tend to look more for the opportunities. That's where it's just their minds start working that way. But there's not a lot of hard evidence yet on how to do this. There's the discovery of it. I said, okay, this goes on, but I'm not sure what to do about it. <laughs> okay. So th that's actually an interesting discussion because – Part of the challenge, like I was just giving an example of ways we can improve and take advantage of opportunity if we blend different styles of life cycle disciplines. Yes. But part of that is experience and understanding what questions to ask, perhaps, and understanding like there's a neat balance to both and different kinds of styles are important. But I think... You're teasing at something, which is interesting, because as timelines become shorter and shorter, as our focus around used to be annual expectations, quarterly, monthly, it's almost now we're living in the tyranny of the moment. And so people have become incredibly focused on the tactical. And so they don't have time to think about, even if they have the experience, I think it depends on where they're positioned and if they're able to ask those questions. But I think positioning people and organizing the, this is like industrial design on how do we start structuring our organizations to make sure that we aren't caught up in the tactical. And Len was talking about earlier, the minutia, the chaos of the moment. We're solving all these problems, but we're not moving the needle. How do we get that? balance there? And is there a need to innovate the management, the structure, the organizational design to make sure, hey, we achieve the, we have to get the tactical done. But how do we always get to that balance thing? I think, Frank, I can't talk to that subject about the timeline of age because I've got a 13 year old that tells me that I'm immature. So that, <laughs> I don't know where that fits into that. Time. But I will say that businesses always Business not always, it's that's not always true. There's a tendency to either throw pe more people on it. You've seen that. Let's put more people on it. Or let's reorganize. Or let's cut costs by cutting out people. Yeah. And I see what that's been some approach to innovation. Yeah, we innovate. We got a director of innovation. 
who sits over in that office, maybe has no one reporting to them. And everybody else is left to stay busy about doing what they're supposed to be doing. You've got to get that into the mindset of individuals to think about where you're headed, the opportunity. And I'll go all the way back to working with Dr. Fernando Flores, 1990. He said, the businesses that succeed are the ones that are making offers, not the ones that are sitting there waiting for requests. If I think about that, what can I tell the business to do? You're creating value. You're solving your problems. What you should be doing is creating value and helping your customers solve their problems. If you are knowledgeable enough, leading, managing well, understand, get yourself out of the chaos, how can I help my customers by delivering what value that they're going to feel that I they can trust me to help them solve their problems. Opportunity is the opportunity you can create for your customers. They'll love you forever. No, well, maybe not forever, but at least until something on social media. For the next day. Stop, right. Stops trending, maybe. I don't know. This reminds me that the joke that they tell, the guy jumps off the top of the building, and about halfway down, somebody else, how's it going? He says, so far, so good. <laughs> That's why I said you, you need to look ahead a little bit. <laughs> it's interesting that you bring up Dr. Flores because I look at him as somebody who has, I don't know, mastered the art of dialogue. He understands the importance of communication. I see a lot of organizations that have mastered the the ability to direct, but I don't see too many that embrace dialogue. That's true. Dialogue's very different. If we're having a conversation, a lot of times br people bring their agenda. They bring their biases to the conversation. They're ready for the conversation. Dialogue means we're both coming to the table. We have some ideas. We have some thoughts. We have biases, of course. But we're going to come to the table and we're going to listen to each other. We don't know where it's going to end up. We're going to open ourselves up to have a dialogue, which means from what we're saying, we're going to build on that. And it's hopefully going to create something different way of thinking or something new perspective for us. And I think that's the dialogue. That's the difference in dialogue versus conversation and direction. Have you seen any organizations that have structured processes or efforts around encouraging dialogue? And if you have, do you see those companies, let's just say, more open to innovation and are maybe more successful at it? I've seen one. I worked with one some years ago and it can't be yours no it's not mine <laughs> it's the only one i've seen and it was a dem democratically run organization half owned by the founder half owned by the people and uh, they voted on their managers things like that and the stuff that you would kind of roll your eyes and say how do they ever make that work they told me it took seven or eight years before they got all the bugs out but once it got rolling they were a very successful company so that's the only one I've ever seen like that. And everything was a dialogue. You talked about stuff in a, when you went to in a meeting, there was not somebody directing the meeting. There was somebody facilitating, but it was a dialogue. People talked about stuff and they talked about what should be the objective. Why are we looking at this? What's the opportunity here? That's the way they look at it. They didn't look at it as a problem. They looked at everything as an opportunity. And that's the only time, and I've worked with probably 200 plus companies in my career, that's the only one I've seen like that. This all this business about empowering and stuff like that, I'm beginning to think that's just so we know where to put blame. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Racy, accountability, everybody yes, wants to racy, accountability. As soon as you know, walk into like, an organization that says, I want a single neck to choke, you're not probably looking <laughs> at a company that's embracing innovation. 
it's like per charts using as a weapon. <laughs> a weapon right. I think a per chart. It's interesting. <laughs> the uh, the word power strikes me as a militaristic term that many companies tend to embrace. They when they have that military mentality, the enemy, it's us against them. It's always that combative model. And I think about the things that Dr. Flores talks about and others who embrace more of a collaborative. I, we live, it's everybody thinks that what we've been taught is that innovation and growth and opportunity come from the competitive mindset. I've even seen structures and organizations where they set different directors and VPs and executives against each other because they're like, that competition's all good. And I'm wondering if companies like the one you just cited, Frank, flip it and say that are able to flip that position and yeah, look at do. opportunity and embrace collaboration and how different they engage their own employees, how well they really understand what you know, the desired outcomes are for their customers, how successful they are. Yeah, I found something similar when I worked for, uh, I, I spent four and a half years at A.T. Kearney, and I found something similar there because they said, when you evaluate and look at somebody else's document, take that as insight, not as a criticism. You follow me? And that's the closest thing I found to it. It's not quite dialogue, but nothing should be punitive in a sense. It should be, you're looking at, I said this, and this is the way they explain it. If somebody takes an hour and a half to read a document you wrote and make suggestion, be respectful of the fact they took an hour and a half to do it. Okay, that's their time and they're trying to improve the quality of what we do here as a company. And I thought that was, a, and I've always remembered that. That's always been a good guideline. One thing I remember is what happened to all of the discussions around high performance teams because when you look at all of that that was written about high performance teams, you really had more leadership and innovation because people knew what they had to do, yet they were able to back each other up. They had a sense of humor. They understood where they were going. They would have dialogue about how well they're doing. All of those characteristics of high performance teams, it seems like that whole discussion has disappeared to some extent. Yeah. And to the point about dialogue in the business, I think some businesses are fooling themselves because they replace this notion of collaboration and dialogue with the word transparency. Mm -hmm. We have to have transparency, which means everybody needs to know every, what everybody's doing, which is not necessarily meaning that you're going to have anything collaborative. As a matter of fact, some people might look at that more as a threat because now I have to expose everything I'm doing as I'm doing it, when I'm doing it. And some folks don't work well that way in the business. But if you think about the high performance teams, I think that was headed in the right direction. And a lot of stuff consultants that we could be guilty of is we always come up with a new method, another four phase, another four quadrant phase or method. We we take something and reinvent it. A lot of the good stuff, just go back to Drucker. <laughs> That's yeah, that's true. Yeah. And you'll find a lot of the foundation of how things have evolved just been called something different. It is it is true. There, companies get caught up in technology. Not so much the understanding about how to measure and so much focus on, I think, performance in many ways is about productivity. They want... That when they talk about high performance teams in many cases, they talk about they're really measuring productivity. How many widgets did you get done? How many times have you been in a company where they're like, we only got three projects done as opposed to the 40 that we wanted, but look at the impact we had in the company. I don't see, I don't remember any companies that said, we don't care how many projects we get done. I want to see the needle move. If the needle doesn't move, you're wasting your time. That's a company I want to work for. But innovation in is one of the measures. What have you created that's different and new and is having a bigger impact? Now, so the, so, measure, so the impact, when you measure the impact, whose impact? 
<laughs> it had an impact on the customer. Okay. And how they're assimilating what you're putting out there. Okay. Because if you're if you have that to take a solution. You don't have don't just go take that initiative and say, okay, let me make sure how it's implemented. Let me ensure how it's integrated. Meaning, I have to be sure that I've got the right perspective and organization to support it in the marketplace, integration within the organization, and then integration in the marketplace for how that product's going to be assimilated. Because then you can understand how to sustain it. You can understand how to innovate it. You can understand how to sunset it and put something else, introduce something new. And that progression says, a lot of people stop with the implementation. Look at the ideas when you evaluate the ideas and get the data, which now you can have with certain analytical tools. Look at the data that tells you, how might it be assimilated? How do I integrate it? Because a lot of times stuff's put out there, but the organization is not aligned to support it. One example I would give is working for a big bank that introduced affinity credit cards. They didn't have internal alignment. Folks would say, oh, I got my Petco visa. What do I do with this? Calling customer support or to register it. Oh, I'm sorry, we don't offer, we don't offer Petco visas. Whoops. Now, I worked with one company to answer your question that I thought was quite innovative, American Express. I think they still are. They came at a situation in travel-related services. You know where they started? They started with a question. Let's not think about what we're doing and how we're doing it right now. You all travel. I want you all to give me a scenario of the worst travel experience not that you've had, but you could have. Give me the nightmare. Give me your scenario of a nightmare travel experience. Then they started to pin where in their process might those things occur. So they started with the flip side. How not how can we be better? What's the worst scenario? Now, how do we compare or align or differ from that? And I'll tell you, I've just watched, been a member of American Express for years, and they were a client for a while. And I think they're one of the more innovative companies. I think that's a great example. And I think there's a lot of stuff we could probably branch off into and talk about from the topics we've covered today. So many interesting points about not just innovation, but the way we companies need to shift the way they operate to the kinds of individuals that can help foster innovation. And I think the key one of the key takeaways for me is just thinking about the way we position innovation by looking at opportunity rather than just always focusing on the problems. And I think making the cultural shift and creating an environment where people look at the opportunities and opposed to the problems that alone can be a way to embrace and engage people better. Oh, yeah. Let me give you a good example of this. And this is a quick one. Then this deals with your friends at American Express. Some years ago, I was giving a talk at a Delphi conference, and it was on artificial intelligence. And one of the examples I showed was a letter I received from American Express. And it said, and my birth name is Francis. F-R-A-N-C-I-S. You can guess already. The letter was addressed to Francis, F-R-A-N-C-E-S, which means they think I'm a woman. And the letter was about that. And my point was, and now there are two executives from American Express sitting in the audience, okay? My point was, always remember this. Along with artificial intelligence, you have artificial stupidity. This is a good example. <laughs> they got really upset and went and complained to the head who set this up, and he said, is there anything that Frank said wrong? They said, no. They said, then he did, there's no complaint. <laughs> nothing is incorrect of what he said. <laughs> yeah, I showed the actual letter. I had it there on a, on a slide showing it. But they thought that this business of artificial stupidity, my point is, be careful about rushing into some of these technologies. And you're seeing some of it now with artificial intelligence again. You're seeing weird results 
that people are getting, not understanding what they're getting into. They're just rushing to be the first with AI or the first with this or to claim they have AI. And it's all about marketing and selling and getting out there in front of people. And then you have to suffer the consequences later. And, and so building on that, the rush to embrace the, the fad, the rush to yes. avoid FOMO, the rush to create, to achieve agendas, as opposed to dialoguing about the opportunity and measuring it with some level of precision and discipline. I'm not saying slow and steady is always the way, but it just seems like the knee jerk reaction is reflective of maybe opportunities to yeah. you, need, you need a flashlight to see where you're going here. Yeah. You know, otherwise, you're going to stumble over something. And yep. in order to, you have to anticipate these things as best you can. You can't do a perfect job. But I think the idea of saying, what's the worst thing that could happen? You just saw it in that example that I showed. And the other thing I have is there's loyalty building and then there's disloyalty building. And I have that in my policies and procedures class I teach that I said, here's how you do disloyalty. And I have examples on really well-known named companies of how they encourage disloyalty. For example, canceling your points without ever telling you what they're doing. That's a disloyalty action. <laughs> Clearly, you don't want to go stay at that hotel anymore if that happens. And they don't, there's no way to take care of it. There's nobody to talk to. And you know what they tell you? It's in our policy. That's why I teach it in the class. I says, be careful of how you state your policies because this is what it costs you. And at that time, we were probably putting, using a thousand rooms a day, a year, a thousand room days a year for the staff I had. They lost all that, by the way, the firm that did that. And it showed up in my class as one of the loyalty points. <laughs> the things that we take for granted when we make policies, it's another one of those things that Len Pope thought earlier, which I think, again, it's if you have an art of dialogue and a discipline around it, you can start to question those things and say, "Do we? Is that was that a good policy? Are we going to get the right outcomes? Yeah. But I think this point of this, like you brought up, the, what's the worst thing that could happen? And I've used that at times. What's the worst thing that could happen on this risk, for example? We could have a tsunami and wipe out the nuclear plant. Oh, you only, there's, you only have one every billion, a million years, so don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. And that's a statistical thing. We had one yesterday. We had one last week. Okay. And there was none for two million years. So I guess the frequency is once every million years. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thinking that goes on. And the assumption is that means I'm not going to have one tomorrow. <laughs> Timing yeah. everything. Yeah. <laughs> I All get right. it. hear this Good. stuff. I just have to roll my eyes. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Good conversation. Len, thanks so much. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, oh, Len, enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Thank you.